<laughs> so today we have uh, Brian Musser, NRCS District Conservationist with Adams County, Indiana, and uh, he just said he's running also Huntington County right now to fill in. And we have Kevin Allison from Marion County Stormwater Conservation District. So let's uh, dive right in with Brian and uh, start uh, his presentation. All right, thanks, Mike. Let me get this going here. Full screen. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Hopefully it's coming up for everyone. My name is Brian Musser. Uh, as Mike said, I'm the district conservationist uh, permanently stationed in Adams County at the Decatur Field Office. Uh, I am currently uh, covering the Huntington Field Office, uh, probably until the end of the year, maybe into early next year. Uh, I've been with the agency now, hard to believe, almost 10 years or just over 10 years. Uh, and then I was with the Steuben County Soil and Water Conservation District for two years before that. Um, so today uh, they've asked me to talk about no-till and then I also added in uh, planting into cover crops. Uh, and I will admit right off the bat, this is a modified presentation from previous. Uh, so hopefully it still fits everything uh, we're wanting to talk about today, but I think it does. So uh, no-tilling. Um, this presentation was originally adapted for corn, uh, as you can see with the picture there. Um, that's a pretty typical looking no-tilled corn field. Um, I asked right before this started kind of what the rough overview of producers were for this group. Uh, and I know with small farming, it can be a wide range of crops, especially special specialty crops. Um, so not all of this is as precise for that. I'm going to default to Kevin for a lot of that knowledge. He is far more knowledgeable in this uh, small farming uh, realm than I am. Um, but when it comes to planting and, and doing no-till, biggest thing is uniformity. Um, we always want to make sure uh, that every seed comes up at the same time uh, as the seed next to it. Uh, that's ever so more important in corn uh, than any other crops. But uh, if we can plant in soil conditions, that are, that are the best for the seed, um, which takes a lot of patience in no-till uh, because it is true, no-till soils can be colder, can be a little wetter, um, but if we can wait until the soil conditions are the most optimum, we can get consistent uniformity, uh, especially in corn, which, which greatly helps uh, with yields down the, down the road. Now, uh, another thing, this is predominantly more for corn, Obviously for your specialty crops, refer to the, you know, the seed recommendation or the depth recommendation uh, with the seed material, um, but try to plant a little bit deeper um, because what happens is, is uh, you know, no-till is, is uh, we're not doing any kind of disturbance. So the soil is gonna be left as it was when you harvest it. So it's going to keep, keep all of the residue cover which is going to hold more moisture, which is going to reduce solar radiation on the soil surface. So that soil again is gonna be a little colder, gonna be a little wetter. Um, but what we do know is, is the residue on top. And then if you were to have any kind of cover crops or anything like that, it does provide really good insulation for the soil. So getting that, so getting that seed, you know, an inch and a half, two inches deep, uh, actually isn't a bad thing because when we get down to that depth, we're going to get more consistent soil temperatures. And it's soil temperatures that, that trigger uh, germination. So if we can keep that seed and all the seed that we're planting at the same temperature, we're going to get consistent germination. So um, I think this would be, would be the similar for our specialty crops or those of you growing specialty crops. Um, you know, when we do tillage and we fluff up that upper part, you know, that upper two inches, basically we're just making it to where when the sun hits that soil, you're probably going to get the same temperature, you know, throughout that two inch profile. And so when we go to no-till, we're not going to have that per se. Um, and that's why going a little bit deeper isn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Okay, 
Uh, again, this presentation was originally designed specifically for corn, but I think it holds true for all crops still. Um, invest in your planter. And I don't know if I have it in words here, but that doesn't mean buy the nicest, newest bells and whistle planter. It just means take the time and make sure the planter is set up for a quality no-till operation. So for corn, again, especially, um, but, but really any crop you're going to use a, a planter for in a no-till situation, you wanna make sure your coulters that actually do the opening, that do whatever little tillage we have in no-till systems are as tight as can be and as sharp as they can be. So the saying is, is you wanna have your coulters at about the width of an of a, a, a index card. So real tight together, nice and sharp, make sure they're, they're ready to go to give you the best uh, opening they can for that seed. Um, the other thing is, is with those coulters, you don't wanna go cheap on the steel with them. A lot of times the biggest wear and tear on them is right around the actual hub where the, where the coulter bolts onto the uh, planting unit. So don't go, don't go cheap on the steel there because that's where you're gonna get the most uh, wear and tear is where that hub is. Um, you know, just going through your planter, you know, month, two months before planting season, or even in the fall after harvest, whenever you get time, uh, make sure it's, make sure it's set up the way you want it to. You're getting the down pressure and the consistency that you want to, um, and, and it's ready to go. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt at all. And I think this is in my next slide, <clears throat> be meticulous. Uh, as you can see, these gentlemen here, they're out behind the planter looking at it. Uh, that's very important when it comes to no-till. Uh, every field, even though it may have the same soil type, uh, has something a little bit different for it. And the planter is going to operate just a little bit differently. So every field you want to plant, you know, 20, 50, 100 feet, get out, go dig up, you know, 10, 15 feet each row. Make sure the seed is getting to the depth that you want. Make sure that it's planting its, the spacings evenly as you want. Just be meticulous uh, that you know the planter is operating the way you want it to. Um, and then if we get transition more into like uh, people who grow cover crops and then want to no-till into that, it, it can be quite the challenge. Uh, this picture here, uh, the cereal right isn't quite as tall as the cab. But I've had uh, more than a couple people tell me they planted into stuff where they couldn't see the front of the tractor. Um, and that can be very intimidating. Uh, this, this piece of equipment here has a crimper that is being pulled behind it. Um, the biggest thing, if you get into uh, no-tilling into cover crops, make sure you are always going the same direction that you crimped the material. And it doesn't even matter if it's one or two rows that are different. If you have a 15 foot crimper or, or 15 foot uh, roller, make sure you have a 15 foot planter because if you start going against any of those rows that you laid down, it's gonna get frustrating really quick. Um, the other thing is, is uh, unfortunately you're gonna have binding and wrapping and, and, and vegetation getting stuck into the planter. Um, it's gonna take more time and effort uh, depending on the field size uh, or between fields, uh, getting that planter back into the right condition that you want for the next field. Uh, and then you've got to get a little creative. Um, I had several guys two springs ago that was really wet uh, say that they felt like they were, they were kind of planting out in the wilderness. Um, so if you can have some kind of RTK or some kind of guidance, that's going to greatly help. Uh, but if not, get a little creative uh, and, and find a way to make sure you know you're going the direction you want to and stay in as straight as you can. Um, I know some people in no-till and some diehard no-tillers don't like uh, row markers, but um, if, if it's all you have, it's all you have. So uh, sometimes we have to make some sacrifices here or there for, for true no-till to make it work for you. Um, and then I know this kind of sometimes uh, can, can be a challenge in our uh, smaller operations, especially if they're organic operations. 
Um, but if you're if you're going to plant green into cover crops or plant into cover crops, we really need to make sure the cover crop is terminated. Uh, so if you are an organic farmer or you have an organic operation, the timing of the crimping is going to be extremely critical. Um, if you are actually going to terminate that uh, that cover crop with just the crimping mechanism, um, if if you're not you know, a herbicide application within two days or three days of planting is always a good idea. Uh, that's going to ensure that the cover crop stays down, doesn't start coming back up. Um, so that that's a very important step in all of this. We can't just assume that, oh, hey, we got the cover crop laid down, we got the seed in the ground, everything's going to be fine. Um, because that cereal rye or any of the taller cover crops we have will start to come back up and that can start causing uh, uh, photosynthesis issues with our actual row crop. Uh, and then the other big thing that we need to remember is we need to keep our young crop fed. Um, when you get into uh, growing cereal rye that's five, six, seven feet tall, you're gonna have a lot of carbon out in the field. Um, so it's gonna take a lot of nitrogen to break that residue down and is, they will, go ahead. Like no till, so no till planting. Yeah. I, I didn't quite hear the question, I'm sorry. I don't think it was intentional. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, we wanna keep we want to keep the crop fed as best as we can early on. So it may require additional nutrient application either before planting or at planting or, or soon after planting. Um, we just want to make sure that we're keeping our, our nutrient uh, availability to that crop as best as we can when we have a higher carbon to nitrogen uh, ratio cover crop out there decomposing. Uh, and then stick to it. I mean, no-till it, it, it's different. It is, not, it is not like pulverizing the ground and having a nice seed bed and, and being ready to go, you know, when you get that first 65 degree day or 55 degree day, it's, you, you've got to start small at it. Um, one of the things that I learned just a couple of years ago that I should have thought of sooner uh, was that, hey, a no-till planter is going to work until soil just as good as a, a normal planter. So, if you are trying to make this transition, you know, set it up for no-till, do your tillage and, and, you know, run it for however many acres you want to try to do. Uh, it will work. Um, it's not going to be a failure just in that. It won't be the exact same, but it's a good starting point. Um, and then the real thing of no-till is making sure that our harvest actually is, is well done. Um, so, so it really starts, as this picture shows, with the combine. We want to make sure we get residue as evenly spread as we can. Um, you know, a lot of times, uh, if we don't pay attention to what's coming out of the back end of the combine, we can get, you know, four or five, even sometimes six inches of residue piled up. And when you go into no-till the next year, you are going to have problems where those residue paths are. Um, so we really need to kind of focus on our combine and how well it is distributing our residue um, in the fall to make sure we have a good start for our no-till in the spring. And then as always, just we have to do our best to minimize challenges. You know, there are countless different resources out there from USDA uh, to Purdue Extension to uh, ARS, all kinds of resources, soil and water conservation districts, uh, the Indiana Department of Agriculture, um, so, so by all means, reach out to those people, bounce ideas off of them, uh, get as much knowledge from them as you can. And then honestly, if you can find a farmer that does do no-till that, that, and you become friends with them or, or at least can communicate with them, that, that can be a really big uh, benefit to you uh, because they've been through the struggles, they know the challenges you're going to face. Um, and they're going to be able to give you tips and pointers on how to kind of minimize those challenges and overcome them. Uh, and then always keep good records. Um, I mean, every year is going to be slightly different from weather patterns to 
seed selection to boy, well, you name it. Um, and some fields are gonna perform better than others. Um, so just keep, keep notes as best as you can. Uh, learn from those notes, just try to keep improving every year. Um, and then some of the benefits, I probably should have started with this slide, but I always think it's good to review that at the end too. Uh, biggest benefit we get with no-till and long-term no-till is uh, we improve the soil structure. Um, when we stop tilling or reduce the amount of tillage we are doing, you are going to see improved soil structure within the first two or three years. Um, it doesn't take too long. Um, and that's, that's really important to the whole foundation of your farming operation and, and the system or in the, the no-till system or the soil health system is getting that soil into a better fitting condition to be beneficial to the organisms in the soil. So when we improve soil structure, we're gonna have that reduced compaction because we're gonna have more roots that are constantly growing in the ground. Uh, those, those roots are gonna open up channels, you know, create soil organic matter in the soil, uh, which is going to lead to better water infiltration uh, and is gonna also improve root development. So, you know, within easily three or four years of, of good consistent no-till, um, mix in some cover crops, you can really and see you can really see any kind of compaction issues you've had or any kind of root impairment that you've had start to alleviate fairly quickly, um, which is a big benefit in the long run. Uh, longer term, we get into more five, six, seven, eight, ten years. Uh, we can definitely start seeing some <clears throat> improved nutrient cycling. Um, this especially, can be accelerated with the use of cover crops and no-till. Um, but as again, we, do, we reduce our soil disturbance or eliminate our soil disturbance, uh, we're gonna allow for the organisms that actually transport nutrients from the soil or from the solutions that we put on the soil to the crop improve. So uh, you're gonna, we're going to be better at getting the nutrients out of our actual soil uh, and, and feeding our crop better uh, than we had been with con continuous tillage or consistent tillage. Uh, and then uh, it, it, you know, it improves ground cover. I would go back to that very first picture I had. Uh, if you have that much you know, corn residue on top, soybean residue even to a degree, um, you're gonna see reduced soil erosion, increased weed suppression. That, that's an amazing thing to me is, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, we need to do tillage. And I know in a lot of organic operations, you know, tillage is kind of the only mechanism sometimes available to control weeds. Well, we've been doing tillage for, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of years now, and we still have weed issues. So clearly tillage doesn't solve weed issues. Um, but if we can, you know, reduce our tillage methods, bring in other options like cover crops to suppress weeds, uh, we can definitely work at minimizing what types of weeds we're going to have out there and to what degree they're growing. Uh, that way they're easier to manage. And then there are several avenues for financial assistance. If you're looking to transition into a no-till operation or you're interested in, in transitioning to no-till, um, through the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, we have a couple different programs. The primary one that I would recommend uh, to get started is the Environmental Quality Incentive Program or EQIP. That provides a flat rate per acre to do the transition. Um, I believe last year it was around 16, maybe 16 and 50 cents, $16 an acre or something like that. Um, and that is a flat payment. So. If you want to do 100 acres of no-till, you're going to get that payment rate times 100 acres to do it. Um, and we don't get hung up on what exactly it takes you to, to meet the standard. The, the goal is that you meet the no-till standard. So if you just need to buy a couple different parts here or there to get your planter ready, or if you need to invest in a whole new planter, it, it doesn't make a difference to us. We just need you to meet the standard with the pay. The next one is the conservation stewardship program. This one would be geared more towards people who have been doing long-term no-till. 
uh, as this, this program rewards producers that have been doing existing conservation, uh, and then it also incentivizes them to do some further, further conservation improvements. And then lastly, the soil and water conservation districts, uh, typically, I mean, I've worked with five or six different soil and water conservation districts, and every single one of them at some point throughout a couple year period has some kind of grant that's available. Now, some of those are specific to buying equipment modification, um, you know, and that, that's just all on how they want to write the grant and, and present the grant to, to producers. So there are definitely different avenues out there for financial assistance. And that's really all I have at this point. Um, this is my contact information. By all means, you can send me an email um, or give me a call at the office. Uh, I, I typically here lately have done better about getting the emails and calls, I'll admit that. But hopefully in the next three or four months, things will kind of slow down a little bit and maybe I can return more calls consistently. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments or discussion that we have. There is something in the chat. Oh, nope, that was Mike. Yeah, if you notice, Mike put in the chat uh, that he's got experience in roller crimping. Uh, yeah, Mike. Mike's a great resource for me. I, I probably don't lean on him as much as I should. Uh, Mike's in the northern part of Adams County, uh, and he has done what what he calls, and a lot of people are starting to call, never till, which is absolutely no kind of soil disturbance at all. Uh, and and man, that's it. It's always amazing to go out to to Mike's property and and just probe around in the soil or dig a soil hole or or dig a soil pit and and explore what's going on. It, it is really unique out there. Thank you, Brian. That is, you. this is one of the best presentations on the no-till and, and uh, cover crop crimping that I've seen. Uh, let's, anybody got some questions? Give us your, uh, tell us what you have to, uh, what you need to know. The, the I love that, uh, I love to channel Yoda, if you remember from Star Wars. Um, I don't remember exactly how he said it. It's do not try, do it. Um, so don't go into the mindset that you're going to try this and see what happens. Go in with the mindset that it's going to work and uh, I'm going to make it happen. So that that is the first step always. And find a mentor, somebody that can help you walk through it to call. I get calls all the time when I'm planting, harvesting uh, to uh, figure out what we can do. And I'm also gonna put a plug in for the Nature Conservancy. Um, mm -hmm. The uh, Defiance Office handles our upper uh, Western Lake Erie Basin, also in Indiana. And they have a program started. It's a farmer to farmer mentor or a conservation advocate where they're training farmers to talk to their neighbors. So if anybody's interested in that one, get a hold of us or the Nature Conservancy. And uh, they, they really want to make that program available across the country to anybody interested in doing that. So uh, as they, as they fine tune it this next one, uh, they might make that available. And I can also feel when Brian talks about it, uh, the frustrations, um, I've been through all of them. Um, I've worked through them all. <laughs> the, when you're planting green into standing cover crops that are as tall or taller than your tractor hood, um, it's, it can be a real challenge. Um, that stuff can wrap on anything that turns. So uh, we have a lot of ways to, uh, help mitigate that to make it work better for you. Yeah, and, and there's a question here from the chat and I do think I've, I missed some of the marks. I didn't cover all the different top types of tillage operations that, that are out there. Um, so so other than, than no-till, uh, what kind of tillage operations are there? Um, there are at least three or four others that we can provide some kind of financial assistance with, not to necessarily the extent we can for no-till, um, but 
the, one of the biggest ones we call is reduced tillage. Um, that one does allow for uh, shallow tillage, you know, up to, I think it's two inches. Most of the time it's vertical tillage tools, um, but that's a one time or, or one off kind of a payment to where, okay, you're gonna transition from a more conventional or, <clears throat> or intensive tillage to a, to a reduced or, or more conservative type tillage uh, operation. So um, mulch tillage is another one. Um, it all starts depending on how much residue is left out there for how we split out what kind of tillage methods there are. Um, and then how to know which one's right for you. I mean, that's, that really becomes a personal preference. Um, you know, if you're on, I would, if I were to be farming, I, I would look at the soil types uh, and, and kind of understand what my soil limitations would be. You know, if you're on sandier soils that, you know, already have low organic matters in them, but do drain well. Uh, and, and, you know, if you're trying to cover a good amount of acres, you honestly can probably get away with a decent, decent amount of tillage um, for, for longer than, than in our heavier soils in this Western Lake Erie area. Um, on heavier ground, you know, your, your blounts or your Palamos, your, your clay soils, um, you know, it, I, I would look into some kind of strip tillage. And if I can, I'll try to go back because the one photo is kind of more of a strip tillage. Let me get myself figured out how to go backwards in my slides. Here we go. <clears throat> so this operation, uh, if you kind of look at this, we've got a disturbed, I don't know if it's caught up for everyone else. Hopefully it has here in a second. We've kind of got a disturbed path through here and then we've got uh, strips of residue in between. Um, Strip tillage is one where uh, it can either be done with the planning unit or usually it's a separate tool um, and, and it's ran for NRCS purposes one time. So either in the fall or in the spring, I like to encourage people to do it in the spring uh, because if we do it in the fall and we get our heavy rains through January, February, March, we can get a lot of erosion down those strips. Um, but basically, you're going to run some kind of tillage uh, tool somewhere between oh, four, four or five inches and just kind of make this strip that's disturbed uh, and that is kind of, for lack of a better word, busts up any kind of compaction layer we have within the growing row. Uh, and then you'll come back in the spring or, or if you do it in the spring, later in the spring and seed right into that row. Um, that's gaining some popularity again, uh, especially with corn. Um, that's typically one that, that people have some interest in for corn. Um, with corn, it's such a finicky crop. It depends on that emergence for quality yield. Uh, a lot of people think we need to do some kind of tillage to make sure we get that consistent uh, emergence. Um, another one that's kind of come and gone when I started 10, 12 years ago, there was, a, there was some that we would see on our tillage transect, um, but it's what we call ridge tilling. And I apologize, I don't have a good picture of that, um, but it's basically taking a tillage unit and you, you, you go straight, you cut it, and then it kind of folds it up into kind of a mound. So when you're done, you kind of have this mound like this, and then you plant right on top of that mound. Um, and again, in the heavier soils, it takes a lot of power from a tractor standpoint to get those ridges established. Um, once you have them established, it's usually not too bad to maintain them. Um, and kind of one of the biggest goals there or thoughts there is by mounding it, uh, you know, two or three inches above the actual soil surface, we're going to get drainage off of that, so it's going to keep the actual seed row a little drier in our wet soils. Um, but here in the last eight years or so, it's really kind of fallen off in our area. Um, I have some people that think it'd be a good thing to come back to. Um, they haven't actually done it yet. Um, but, you know, ridge till, strip till, no till, uh, those are the three predominant conservation tillage uh, methods across 
the, the Northeast area of Indiana um, and probably even across the country. Um, vertical tillage tools, that again is more of our reduced tillage. Um, uh, th that's a real, and, and I'm sure Mike can chime in here when I'm done, that's a real interesting point. It, it is definitely conservation tillage because we are not disturbing the soil as deep as what normal or typical tillage does, but we're still, we're still running the risk of compacting those top two inches, which again is where you're going to seed your crop and can become a uh, pretty vital uh, part for, for germination and, and seed establishment. Um, I saw a presentation a few years back at the National No-Till Conference and, and the speaker per, compared vertical tillage to like laying down a sheet of visqueen across your field. So you're gonna have this real nice two inches that you know you think you can do anything with, but by consistently using it, you're just building this compaction layer two inches down that you know nothing's gonna eventually infiltrate through from water or, or seed roots. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting. I have a lot of producers in Adams County that use vertical tillage tools to seed cover crops. Um, it's, it's, it's not probably my favorite method because usually we're waiting and when you get into a fall like we have right now where it seems like we're getting two inches of rain every week or every other week, there's just never any time to go out and actually do the work. Um, if you were to use a vertical tillage tool, seeding a cover crop or seeding weed or something like that, I think you're mitigating, there's a high probability that you're mitigating uh, the, the compaction damage that you're doing by running the tool with seeding the cover crop. Because um, it does do a decent job of getting that seed to soil contact uh, for getting cover crops established. Uh, I think there was another one that came in there. I, I popped it away there. Uh, or there's a couple now. Let's see. Okay, so one that came in on a small scale for an acre garden or mowing, or oh, is mowing or cutting acceptable for a cover crop? Um, yeah, I, I would say yes. I'm not sure what, if you're just talking about mowing your yard, I mean, yeah, as the, the whole goal of our cover crop is to keep some kind of uh, vegetation growing uh, either on or around where you're going to seed traditionally. Uh, so, yeah, I yeah, I would think that would be just fine um, as, as kind of a cover for your normal garden area or your garden bed. Uh, oh, and Kevin, good. Kevin chimed in there at the end. I should have kept going. Kevin will get into that. Good. Hey, Brian, um, one thing, we are in a very wet fall. We seem to be getting rain every uh, few days now. Soil structure, can you just talk on soil structure and how it helps carry the equipment, especially the heavy combines across our fields now? Uh, is that a point? Yes, that's, that's something I didn't put in here. Um, you know, as we get into four or five years of, of good, consistent, reduced till, no-till, preferably no-till, uh, that soil structure is going to build and you are going to be able to be out in your field. Uh, I don't know about tremendously more, but more than people who have fully tilled fields. Um, it's amazing. Just some, some soil types you can get away with it just in a couple of years. Um, but, but unfortunately, the heavier soils, it takes a couple of years uh, in, our, in the Western Lake Erie Basin area. Um, if you add cover crops to that, oh man, it, it definitely tremendously helps. Uh, just having all of that old root structure in the ground really kind of, it's almost like putting rebar in your ground. Um, it really puts a way to, to build the soil to keep it from just compacting and folding down on itself. Um, you know, soil is made up of, of minerals, water, and air. And usually it's the air part that a lot of people forget about. Um, so we've got to have poor spaces in our soil for air to be, and, and when we have roots or, or even extra residue on top that gets pulled down into the soil by earthworms and different organisms, we can start building those pockets for, for improved uh, air structure and, and actual structure in our soil. Um, 
there was something there I, for, I apologize Mike that I was going to address too and I, I just lost it all of a sudden yeah I think um I've been I've been at the no-till and uh, moving to cover crops and now the planting green and roller crimping since the late 80s and uh early on I was these kind of years I would be getting ruts the tires would actually push mud yeah. um now uh, yeah I, I just finished my soybeans on Friday Saturday evening the most uh, I ever put in my ground was lug marks from my combine and yeah. It's really bad for me when it is the full lug going down in. Yeah. Uh, normally, I would just get a little stuff. So I'm getting the full lug down in there, but no smearing, no uh, rutting. Uh, so it carries over a lot better. Good. That's great. And I, I, I thought of it while you're talking there. Um, we're starting to have people experiment with different ways to plant cover crops or get cover crops out earlier. Um, and that really can make a big benefit to fall harvest like this. Uh, you know, Allen County now for, I don't know, Mike, what's it been, five, six years have been doing the interseeding program? Yeah, we were interseeding into standing corn, uh, V4 to V7, so ankle to knee high, yeah. and getting some good uh, results from that. Uh, depends on chemical, uh, what herbicides you're using is one of the worst uh, offenders. So, you know, we have to adjust that to get it done. Um, Myself, I, I put it in with a haggy at Black Layer, so mm -hmm. usually around Labor Day for us. And then I can get Cerari in, and uh, the Cerari now and, and the volunteer clover from uh, the crimson clover from my early crimping is uh, covered the cornfield. I have a green mat in my corn. So yep. I also had some volunteer uh, crimson clover and a little bit of a bean field that I had uh, had harvested Cerari off of. and. Uh, had no problem getting through the combine with that crimson clover. I was really surprised. I thought I was going to have an issue there. So sometimes Good. what we leave in the field is not always weeds, uh, you know, not always harmful to us. Right. So, yeah. And, yeah. So between between doing interseeding, you know, there at V4 to V7 or, or some kind of, you know, aerial application or using a high boy seeder, um, you know, we get those cover crops out there get a couple of good rains on them, get them growing. And, and it is, it's amazing how much more uh, structure that gives your soil to be out on wetter conditions like we're having for harvest. Um, you know, in Adams County, we had a program just two years ago uh, and we didn't have a tremendously wet fall, but, but the rain that we did add, we had quite a few people tell us, you know, hey, I didn't think I'd be able to get out here uh, like I did. And, and they were pretty impressed with how little rutting or even lugs they left in the soil. So that was really good to hear. Another good resource is the Soil Water Conservation Districts because a lot of them, a lot of us do demonstration plots or we know mm -hmm. either on a farm or people's farms that will allow us to go on to it. And field days are a really good way to pass on information and to, to absorb information. Definitely. Definitely, and we're starting to have them in person again, so that's starting to be really nice. Yeah, it's quite a change <laughs> yeah. last year. Um, how about if we, we move on to Kevin, uh, Kevin Allison from Marion County SWCD. Uh, he's going to talk about gardening and uh, cover crops and uh, no-till, I hope, uh, we're going to move into. So, Kevin, you want to join us? Sure, thank you. Um, let me get my presentation up here. You see that? Okay. We can see no-till gardening and it looks like a lot of colorful lettuce on it. All right, great. Yeah, that's already been consumed. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Kevin Allison. Um, I'm with the Marion County Soil and Water Conservation District in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, Got to apologize that I'm drinking tea, not coffee, and I won't be talking too much about tillage, but rather no-till. <laughs> so just want to thank the Allen County um, SWCD and the USDA for supporting all this. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll roll through it. And any questions you've got, um, I'm not sure if I can see the chat, right? Yeah, 
yeah, I can kick the chat up if I need to. So feel free to just speak up or um, yeah, put something in the chat. So um, traditionally, um, to to grow vegetables, I think like a very common method would be to to mow whatever's out there, to to till it. Um, most gardeners use like a rototiller, um, and then maybe wait a couple of weeks for that residue to break down, maybe disc it again, and then plant. So it just in context, that's kind of like the it's kind of what I'm trying to move away from, but and I, I think just to let you know too that this this presentation will be mainly focused on the garden scale. Um, I do work with like market gardeners um, up to you know two to three acres, um, but and for the purposes of this, I think I'll mostly concentrate on smaller gardens. But definitely, we'll have some, um, yeah, definitely have some things to say about market gardens too, if um, if we want to go there too. So this is this is my garden. Um, it's probably where I'm most comfortable. Um, you can see that there's, um, might be a little bit difficult to see, but it's kind of broken out into to bed. So that first bed in the foreground, you see some beet leaves and some lettuces. That second bed is tarped. Um, that tarp is actually being used to do like a no-till termination of the existing crop, um, which that spring was spinach. Um, so just an FYI, fast forward two weeks from then, um, that, that spinach was actually um, or any weeds and like residue spinach was weed eated, weed whacked down. You could use a flail mower on that market garden scale, um, but it was weed whacked and then um, tarped for a couple weeks. Um, that maybe we can get in a little bit more tarping in the Q and A, but gen generally um, it takes about three to four weeks in the spring to terminate a cover crop like that. Um, during the summer, it might go down to like two weeks um, and kind of depends on just how warm it is. The warmer it is, the probably less it's gonna take. Um, it also depends on what kind of crop it was. Like it's probably a lot more, a lot harder to kill cereal rye. Um, you can do it three to four weeks, but it might be quicker to kill something like a, like a leguminous cover crop like hairy vetch or crimson clover. Um, so that tarp would be pulled off and then we would be planting that next crop right after that. Um, so these beds go through crop rotations. Um, I try to keep all my families together. So on one bed, I might have um, the brassicas. On another bed, I might have the lettuces. And then the cons consecutive years, I just kind of try to try to flip those through um, and move those rotations through the beds. Um, so I'm not going to dwell too much on the, the, the importance of soil health because, um, yeah, it's Brian talked about that well. Um, but I do want to, to kind of stress that bottom one, enhancing diversifying soil biology. Um, I think um, one of the things that I was asked to talk a little bit about was nutrients, um, and I think um, you know how do you how do you apply nutrients or incorporate amendments on a no-till garden? Um, and I think while that's important to discuss, um, that enhancing and diversifying soil biology, so actually building the soil health in your soil, um, is probably going to do you a lot more good long term and maybe even short term than you know putting on putting on um, fertilizer. So not to say that fertilizer is bad; some crops need it, um, but I think the more we can push biology and like just make, yeah, kind of like harnessing soil health to, to, to give us our nutrients, um, I think the better we're off for it. Um, so these are the practices that I mainly use in the garden. Um, soil health management plan, that sounds like a very formal word, but I think to me that just means, you know, just having those four principles always in my mind, like, um, yeah, reducing disturbance, um, keeping the soil covered as much as possible, um, diversifying as much as possible. So just diverse plants and biology um, and then continuous living roots. Um, so having roots in the soil photosynthesizing year round um, is a great way to feed the biology and keep those nutrients cycling, keep the soil covered and everything just fed. Um, the permanent bed system, which I'll take a couple of slides to kind of explain that. Um, a lot of folks do garden in like flat gardens, right? With no, with no kind of like Distinguish, distinguishing areas between between the, the, the crops. Um, a lot of urban growers and just market gardeners um, do use a, a permanent bed system. And by that, you can kind of look at that top right picture and see like 30 inch beds, and then maybe like an 18 to 20 inch walkway, and then another 30 inch bed, um, and then a 20 inch walkway. And those vary, you know, some growers like four feet wide beds, you can probably plant more Space in a forty a four foot bed, um, the, the the thirty inch bed might be easier to kind of hop over and manage, um, like site like to kind of reach in if you're if you're shorter. Um, so there's some intricacies there, but I really like that that permanent raised bed raised bed system. It's helped me reduce tillage, um, just because it's um, 
yeah, there's lots of reasons for it. And I think that'll kind of be self-explaining as I move along, but it's just, um, it's just a really good system to keep everything organized. Um, so crop rotation, as we discussed, um, reducing the tillage. Um, so when we're not tilling in this, this residue and like, like old lettuces and old corn stalks, um, there's some kind of management that might need to happen with those, with the, with the residue. Um, sometimes it's just letting biology break it down. Sometimes it's raking it off. Um, if we actually need to seed one of those beds, like, because it might be hard to seed lettuce into corn stalks. So um, we'll get into that a little bit, but just um, an overview of practices. Mulching, hugely important. Um, I think, I used to think of mulching as just straw and hay, um, but I've really come to, to see that a lot of the, the, the successful growers are also using compost as a mulch. So not necessarily like high, um, like high nutrient packed, like nutrient concentrated, like animal manures, because that might burn crops, et cetera, and cause leaching and runoff and, um, and some maybe just excess nutrient balances, but more so um, kind of plant derived mulches like um, leaf compost or maybe even wood chips that are broken down. I wouldn't necessarily put wood chips directly on top of my growing beds. Um, a lot of growers do use them in those walkways that I've been talking about. Um, but on top of the beds, it's, it's probably, um, as Brian mentioned, maybe just too much carbon, um, and that might just offset some, some nutrient, or yeah, just might um, induce some nutrient imbalances. So, but keeping, um, keeping the soil covered with, um, with mulches is, is like keeping that, oh, I, I kind of refer to it as the O horizon, um, and that was kind of inspired by a book that I'll talk to you about a little, in a little bit. <laughs> um, but keeping that old horizon um, healthy and just covering the soil. So that top right picture, I think what I was getting at was that that used to look like tillage to me, um, but really that's just compost mulch, like kind of mulch slash compost um, on top of the soil, protecting the soil. So anytime I can use a mulch to protect the soil, um, I'll do that. Um, cover crops, um, I know the focus of this is tillage, but I can't really talk about Garden, my way of gardening, like in the way I garden in my, in, in my, in my garden without using cover crops. Um, there are a lot of farms that do do no-till, um, that can do no-till sequence, sequences without cover crops, um, but it'll probably take more mulch, right? Because if you're not pushing out, um, like growing mulch yourself with cover crops, or you're not, um, you're not um, tilling to kill the weeds, you've got you've to stop the weeds somehow. Um, and so that's probably... Um, either light tillage or like, or like skim tillage, um, like with hose or mulching those weeds out. Um, and so, yeah, then nutrient to took fertility management, um, which we can discuss probably, maybe Q and A might be best, best for that. Um, so the permanent bed system, just to kind of show you what that looks like on a urban scale or small farm scale. Um, there's, yeah, just, I think I would recommend um, so there's a lot of information about like spacing and like row spacing of vegetables, um, like Purdue Extension's got valuable information, um, but there's some really good ideas and tables um, from some of the, the successful growers that um, I'll, sh I'll show you a list of books. Um, but for example, Jean Martin Fortier's The Market Gardener um, just has a really nice table about how to space these vegetables in this intensive system. Um, and I think it's important in the context of no-till, because if you just have one row of beans or one row of lettuce shooting down to a hundred foot bed, um, and then in like two feet over, there's another row of lettuce, you know, there's two feet in between that you're not, that you've got to deal with somehow, um, whether that be weeding it or, or hoeing it or keeping it tilled. So this intensive spacing, like just crops group really tightly together, um, just helps develop that can canopy. It helps keep the soil armored. Um, and it's, it's profitable. It's, you can grow a lot of food that way. So just as an example, some growers might use, um, I don't know, maybe four, four rows down a 30 inch bed of lettuce, or maybe two rows of kale, like spaced to 18 inches apart, um, down a 30 inch bed. Um, so there's definitely some, some tables that, that can be super helpful in thinking that through. I, I like to refer to them all the time. Almost every spring when I go to plant, um, I'm always looking at that tables to just make sure I've got my spacings right. Um, so just an aerial of kind of the farms that I, that I work with, you can see those raised, raised beds, um, raised bed systems. I know it's hard to see, but if you were to zoom in, um, you would see rows that are covered in black plastic. Um, now, traditional vegetable growing, um, there's 
there, there is, you know, on big fields, there's a lot of like black plastic use. Um, but this, like kind of in the, the tractor sense, you know, the tractor might lay down um, black plastic over almost over the entire field even. Um, but this is um, on this on this scale, this kind of hand labor scale, it's usually not to say that black plastic isn't used, but um, most of the black plastic that you see here are is more of the, the silage tarp kind of materials that are not necessarily staying on for a whole season, but you being used to transition from one crop to the next. Um, because a lot of these farms are doing maybe two to three to even four crops on a bed per year. Um, so one traditional way of doing it would be to, you know, to grow the crop, till it in, plant the next crop. But a lot of these folks don't want to destroy that permanent bed system. And they know that tillage is not that good. <laughs> so um, they'll use that silage tarp to kill the existing crop and then remove it a couple of weeks later um, and plant that next crop. So that's just what a um, yeah, 30 inch bed might look like, but you can still see that if you, if you treat it poorly, like you can see on the, in the, in the walkways, that's, that's compacted. It's tilled pretty heavily. So I think this is one of those farms that, well, I know this is one of those farms that, um, is trying to push towards more towards like reduced tillage and cover crop use, but it's just, um, yeah, on that scale, like I think garden on the garden scale, it's a little bit easier than trying to do this on one and a half acres. Um, not to say that it can't be done because it is being done, but I think that's why SWCs are here too. Um, and yeah, just to kind of help help through that process. So the bed flip, um, that's kind of what growers call like flipping from one bed to the next, right? One crop to the next. So on the left, you can see like beets. I think those were beet greens that were harvested. Um, I think they started coming back on me. I weeded them. Um, tarped it, pulled the tarp off, and that's what I was left with. So you've got a bed with some, like some beets kind of in the ground, um, but more or less like a clean bed. Um, now that, um, yeah, I'll get to, I'll get a little bit to what that might look like if it was a different kind of crop. But so in general, um, a lot of growers would take a tool like this, or maybe even a smaller, smaller tool called a tilter. Um, this is actually a rotary or a power harrow. Um, so they're going right over the top of that 30 inch bed and incorporating it. Now that would be the time to maybe put on amendments, um, like your, whatever, whatever your soil test might say, or whatever that grower is accustomed to, whether it be like, like feather meal or alfalfa meal. Um, most of the growers I work with do use organic amendments, um, but they're using that power harrow to, and you can do this with a rake too, right? Um, but to kind of incorporate that amendments, and it's usually just like a couple inches down that they go, maybe even an inch, um, so it's to incorporate the amendments and also to, to, to get a seed bed prepared. Um, so those, you can kind of see that walkway that he's standing on. Every few years, um, they will take a rotor or a power harrow, or sorry, a rotary plow um, on the back of that DCS push behind tractor, um, walk behind tractor, and they'll, they'll kind of kick up the, um, they'll kick up the walkway, the mulch in the walkway or the soil in the walkway onto the top of the bed. Um, it just kind of reforms the bed and replenishes it. So it's an interesting thing that, that folks are looking at now that, I mean, even myself, I used to think, gosh, I'm like, if I rake straw off into the pathway in my garden, I'm losing it, right? But in a sense, like, I think if I ever do pull up that walkway material into my beds to kind of form it up again, um, that's kind of like an organic, organic matter stockpile that I'm, that I'm drawing from that was in that, that walkway. Um, so somebody like John Martin, as you see in the picture here, like he's actually using ramule wood chips or like small, like wood chips made from small, um, smaller diameter, like um, hardwood trees because they're nutrient packed. Um, so that's kind of his go-to on doing his walkways. Um, and then that fertility will eventually get up onto the bed. Um, so while that's I think that's tillage, right? Like it's, it, it is, it's, it's disturbing the soil. So I will, I will start moving away from that in, in this presentation, but just to let you know that a lot of, like a lot of gardens do this um, and urban farms do this, um, but then just realize that, you know, once that crop is up, um, you're gonna need to manage the weeds somehow because tillage does bring up, like it will germinate weeds. Um, so um, over time, those, those weeds will come up and you gotta do something about it. So. That usually entails something like a collinear hoe or a wire weeder. Um, and that was my daughter asking me if she can have Pringles. What time is it? It's like 10 o'clock, <laughs> 9 o'clock. Um, so yeah, so the, the, it's, it's more of like a, a, a hoeing through the fields. Um, some growers will actually do this before 
weeds even start to pop um, just to make sure they don't come. Um, so that, while well, that strategy, like, and we're talking like an eighth of an inch kind of thing, right? That's not going down very deep, but I think it still, it still is, um, it still cracks the surface. It still like messes with that rainfall, how it hits the soil. Um, and I think some of the farmers that are really shooting for like, like never till kind of thing um, would prefer not to do this. Um, they probably prefer having like, like on, on that big picture on the right, you see soil. I think they would prefer to have almost like more of like an organic layer on top of that. So maybe that leaf compost or some kind of compost that they've made. Um, and then when they're actually doing that, like if you don't, some people put on that compost really thick to where there's no weeds that are going to pop, but that starts to get into some different intricacies because when you put four inches or six inches of compost on, it kind of changes the dynamic of, of soil. Um, but if you do one inch or a quarter inch, it may not be enough to stop the weeds. So some hoeing may be necessary or hand pulling may be necessary, um, but at least you wouldn't have to do, at least it would be enough mulch to maybe like reduce the weed pressure. Um, and in a garden scale, I think that's okay, right? You can kind of like skip around and, and just kind of spot weed where, where need be. Um, so some growers do do those, those, those shallow tillages because some of their, um, some of their equipment works better. Um, some of their planting equipment works better in like soil that's been broken up, um, like the six row cedar, the paper pot transplanter, certain weeding tools, um, even the earth waste cedar, which is like a one row cedar that's very commonly used to plant both cover crops and crops. Um, although some folks are finding that earth waste cedars can push through a little bit of residue. Um, so that might be, um, it might be okay to have a little bit of residue. You might not need to have that tilled situation to use some of these one row cedars. I'm looking forward to getting me one next year just to kind of experiment with that. Um, so let's say you don't till it, right? Um, so then what? Like, let's say, let's try to do this like in a no-till kind of thing. So I've tried, I've tried this, I've tried hoeing. Um, depending on what the current, like the exist, like the previous crop was, in this case, it was sorghum sedan grass, which is a really bulky cover crop. This didn't work so hot. It was really hard to rip furrows through. Um, it's really hard to rip furrows through with a pointed hoe through something like cereal rye um, or sorghum sedan grass. I'd say those would be like the two big ones. Um, it's hard to do with like some crops like corn, right? So, um, so yeah, this this is a little bit messy. Um, although it it can be done, like, and I think like I'm going to continue to do this. But I think a light layer of compost, like leaf compost, on top of this would have maybe when I when I do that when I do that um, that furrowing, I think it would lighten the stress on the soil a little bit, just because you do have some organic matter content above, and maybe you wouldn't need to dig so deep. Um, with the hoe to get that seed depth because you've got some organic matter layer up top. Um, so a lot of folks wouldn't maybe try that because of germination success. Like without that compost layer and, and trenching through like heavy residue, some germination, like I'm not sure you're, you're going to get perfect germination like some market gardeners would want. I'm okay with spotty and I say spotty germination. It's not spotty. It's, it's I would say like maybe 90%. Um, it's good. It's good, but it's not perfect. It's not that straight row full of, you know, full of like perfectly placed seeds. Um, so that's a consideration. Um, however, some some people are trying it. This is um, this is Dan Perkins up in Demont, um, Indiana, and he actually I can't remember what the previous crop was, but there's there's some residue out there. There's some chunky material out there from the previous crop and maybe some compost. Um, and he went through that with a Jang cedar. Which is a one row unit and push kind of push unit. And it's got um, if you if you if you could pay the extra to get the double disc opener attachment, that's probably one of the better like seeding tools to get through residue. Um, the earthway is decent too, but um, or could be decent. Some growers are finding, but I think this tool is is being found that it's also can be helpful um, to get through that kind of residue. So that's a, an option for some growers. Um, on the small garden scale, I'm not sure that would make sense, like economically, unless you just really want to try that and <laughs> it look, look fun to you. Um, but I think mostly working with like, like the pointed hoe um, is where I'm at. So again, that compost layer, that added compost layer is extremely helpful um, in like less lessening the, the impact of um, whether it be pointed hoes or even like a, a one-way cedar going through these beds. Um, so you can see kind of a, a setup where 
the beds are have been composted, the walkways are not. So you're concentrating fertility on the on the on the beds. And then just being cognizant of what the, the previous crop was, right? So these are these are all things that I wouldn't be scared to to terminate and then maybe seed through or even be able to rake off and then seed through or and rake off and then seed the bed. Um, because they're they're kind of like um, I guess they would be, I'm not sure the carbon nitrogen ratio is all them, but like you can kind of tell that like oats and lettuce and hairy vetch, they're just, they're probably a little more low carbon and nitrogen ratios and they're, they'll break down more quickly. They just don't make like big root balls like a cereal rye or like a kale would. Um, so, you know, just being cognizant like to seed through something like this, like cereal rye might be a little bit more difficult than to seed through something like oats. <coughs> Excuse me. So just a general like approaches to the permanent raised bed systems. So I think I talked about shallow disturbance for incorporation of amendments, um, and then just anything up to using like deep compost mulch, um, and then somewhere like in between, right? I think that's where I'm at. I think I'm somewhere like in between um, using um, cover crops to try to push out weed suppression and um, a little bit of leaf compost here and there when I can get it or when I've got access to it or when I've got the time to put it on. Um, and yeah, just kind of building the system that way. Um, so mulching is, is very important. Um, it's a big part of this. Like, I guess just to let you know, like there's a, this book here that I'm just reading, um, highly recommend it. It's Daniel May's No-Till Organic Vegetable Farm. You know, he's using, I can't remember how big his farm is, but it's like, let's say an acre and a half, but I think he's using like, he's, he was using like upwards of like 120 tons of leaf compost um, to get his garden, to get his market garden started. And so that's a lot of material, um, but it, it, he feels like it's worth his investment to, for soil health to, to do that. Um, on the small scale, like I think I've used, my garden's like 25 by 75. Um, I think I used like two and a half, three yards of compost this year. Um, I know it's an investment. Um, it takes some time. It takes maybe even some money if you don't have like access to make your own compost pile. Um, but I've seen my organic matter levels rise because of it. Um, I've seen biology increase. I've seen the earthworms go crazy just because of that extra layer of organic matter. Um, and then also like using it to establish things like cover crops. Um, so there's some, there's some vegetables with some leaf compost on top. Um, I think, you know, it comes in all shapes, sizes, and forms, but like if you've got, if you get some chunky stuff, like that's more like, you know, 50 to one carbon and nitrogen ratio. So like not very broken down, you know, just be cognizant that that might be harder to seed into, like might be good for transplants, um, but maybe not so much seeding. You might need something more fluffy and fine, um, something that's more aged and broken down for something like a seed. Um, so that's, um, I'll, I'll get to books, but um, just, to, just to let you know, Jesse Frost, um, he runs Hotel Growers. Um, their podcast and their, their YouTube channels. And even just, he just wrote a book. Um, he describes four different kinds of compost. So I'd, I'd recommend anybody that's really getting into no-till gardening to read that book and just to study kind of his thinking on, you know, different kinds of composts and when and where they should be used. Um, and it kind of goes back to, you know, like a high potent, high potency, like animal manure might not be right for this kind of system, you know, if laying, laying on top, just because it's just too hot, like too, too potent. Um, so, he kind of focuses and that's where I'm heading to just more of like, just more, um, just a mulching effect and also like just stuff that's good for biology. So compost teas, um, diverse compost, um, et cetera. So this is a, this is a, um, you know, I showed, I showed that slide of like three different kinds of beds. This is, um, this is a, like three different kinds of raised beds, you know, shallow mulch, maybe deep mulch. Um, this is a, a farm in California that this was their slide about how they transition from one bed to the next. And it's a very high compost heavy farm. Um, and I know we could probably get into like the phosphorus considerations of that. Um, but that set aside, like this is, this is what they're doing and it's very effective for them. So they're just like clearing the bed. Um, they pull the weeds. It's, it's broad forked, which I'll show you what that looks like. Um, and then the, they lift the pathways, which I, I spoke about, like, like pulling the pathways up under the top of the beds. 
Um, they put organic fertilizers on, and then they compost. So there's no tillage really. It's just compost <laughs> mulching up, right? Um, and then transplants. They they think that transplants are like their most prized tool in agriculture because um, it is like you can you can kind of plant into more as we discussed. We can you can plant into more thick mulches. Um, it doesn't have to be as fine or broken down. Uh, the transplant's a little bit more resilient than, than getting seeds started. Um, so a broad fork, um, I use this on, on my garden. Um, I would like to stop using it. That's my intention. Um, but I start off in a tilled, like very high clay, like compacted soil. And the broad fork is a tool I actually use, if you can see on my, the right, like my daughter, I think on the top right, um, she's got like a, I almost saw like a potato fork. Um, that's what I use just because it's a little bit more convenient for me um, to travel around in my car with it. Um, but if I had a garage right by my, my community garden, I would get one of these broad forks um, because it's it's a really good tool. It's basically you, you're sticking to the ground, you're stepping on that bar to push it in, maybe down six, eight inches, and then you're just rocking it back and sliding it out. So you're not flipping the soil, you're just like rocking it back and and slipping it out. Um, and then maybe coming back a foot or a foot and a half um, and doing the same thing. And this just kind of cracks the soil. Um, I used to think of this as tillage. I still might, I mean, it's, it's disturbing the soil, but um, if, as long as you don't do it when it's wet, I think that effect um, will, will kind of help roots dig a little bit deeper. Um, even folks that, that do this before planting carrots know that when you harvest carrots um, later on, once they're ready, it's a lot easier to pull out. It's just like a lighter, more aerated soil. It's probably more like a like something like a, a deep ripper on a big farm kind of thing, um, but kind of helpful. So just knowing which ones, um, and I'm still learning about vegetables, <laughs> but you know, just one which ones you can, which vegetables are better direct seeded and which ones are transplanted. So just kind of looking at those resources and um, thinking through which ones can be transplanted might help you target your your systems better. Um, so I think we're still talking about mulch. Um, you know, that spinach is coming up just fine on the left. And later on, I mulched in between it um, just to stop the weeds. And because I was didn't like seeing that bare soil for even six inches between the, the crop rows. Um, that might be a little extreme. Um, it's, it would be hard to do this on a, an acre scale, um, like an intensive productive acre scale to actually like use hay or straw them to, to mulch in between the rows. Um, but on my garden, I think it's doable. And I think that's kind of why folks are leaning more towards like the darker, like leaf compost and like the, like the, like the compost as a mulch, because it kind of takes that, it takes that step out. Like you can actually, you could probably put that mulch on before you even plant that crop. Right. So, um, you don't really have to worry about planting the crop and then coming back and mulching. It would be hard to put on hay or straw and then try to seed something through that. Transplanting is different. It's possible, but to seed would be a little tricky. Um, before leaving mulch, I want to say landscape fabric is something that, that is used. Um, and it might be like, you know, if you're transitioning from a very weedy spot, like a weedy garden to, to something that's to a no-till garden, um, you know, especially if you're at scale, like I think you can do it without fabrics on a small garden scale. But if you're, you know, you're on a big scale, sometimes landscape fabric for that first year or even like the plastics that, um, like, like full year plastics for a crop, um, might be beneficial just to just to almost have like uh, like block the sunlight on those weeds right for for a year. Um, you know this particular farmer I think was using this landscape fabric in place for like two or three years and rotating crops with that same kind of spacing that he's burned his holes in his his transplant holes um, and planting crops and then probably after two or three years he would remove that landscape fabric take that tunnel and maybe move it to a different spot and then probably cover crop this these three beds or four beds um, just to start re like rejuvenating soil health. Um, there's also some use for, um, I found it handy like the like the, a newspaper print rolls, like just kind of the old lasagna gardening thing, right? Sheet mulching. So I find it helpful to, um, to use a, sh uh, a layer of, helpful for weed suppression to use a layer of newspaper in some instances um, and then put some straw or hay on top of it. Um, it just, it seems like that one, even one layer of newspaper can help stop weeds, like in, in conjunction with like straw or hay um, is, seems like it's much better at stopping weeds than just the straw or hay alone. Um, so that, 
kind of diverse mulch, um, extra measures to just, yeah, to stop weeds. That might be what that looks like um, on a bed. Like it's pretty much just on the left there, I'm just opening up a transplant hole and, and transplanting in. Um, and I think I would bring that mulch around the, the stem of the plant. Um, probably wouldn't have it touching it um, just because of rot, but keep, get it fairly close. Um, on the right, you can see, I think that's a row of, um, yeah, I think it's squash. So that was, um, I put newspaper down the sides of it um, and some straw on top. And I can't remember why I didn't hug that, that those paper right up a little bit closer um, to it, but you know, there's, you can kind of see a weed zone in, in the planting row. Um, and I think that year I actually did that trenching um, with, a, I made a, a, a row with, a, with the, um, the pointed hoe. And I think that disturbance, which I'm trying to get away from even still, and I'll, sh I'll show you a little bit later about what, like I'm trying to do that, but I think that disturbance with that pointed hoe even like churned up weed, weed seeds. Um, and made that planting row just a little bit more weedy through the year. Um, so in general, like we'll get into cover crops, but in, because I think it's an part, important part of a no-till garden, um, but to get it established, to get a cover crop established, like, you know, some, some beds, I think that's another reason why the permanent bed system is really important because, you know, some, if you've got all your, cover, your vegetables like mixed up in one bunch, you know, it's hard to say I'm done with this part of the garden because there might be still a tomato plant lingering. So if you've got it on the permanent raised bed system where one bed is tomatoes and peppers maybe, and the next bed is lettuce, you know, maybe that lettuce is done in August, maybe it's done in September, maybe your, your other bed's done in like October. So in using that, you can kind of, okay, if this, once this bed's done, I'm gonna either plant another crop or I'm gonna plant a cover crop. Um, whereas, yeah, so it kind of helps, it, I think it helps kind of facilitate that. So. Cover crops do take off a lot better if you get them incorporated. Um, so I usually use a rake. Um, like it's probably, if, if I can, it's the, the previous crop, I'm gonna tarp it if I've got time. Um, some I don't, some are not weedy at all, right? So you can just kind of remove the crop, cut the crop off um, out and then, and then rake like maybe a quarter of an inch and seed, um, broadcast your cover crop and then rake it in again. And by raking it, I'm just talking about like just like hitting with a rake and just kind of fluffing, um, getting it down like maybe a quarter of an inch. Um, I know peas like to be, you know, two inches deep, but I really don't like to disturb my soil that deep. So I just kind of take my chances and think that, okay, a quarter of an inch is, is going to be, is going to be good. <laughs> um, this is a, a bed that was, I think, maybe onions. Uh, so that was me trying to do some there's some residue there. I think I used a pointed hoe to try to like make free furrows through there um, to try to get some seed depth, but you can kind of see the soil disturbance that I did there. So I didn't like that. I didn't, I didn't love it. I know soil health can rebound, especially if you leave, like, if you don't like destroy all your biology, there's, you know, there's still biology three inches down and it's going to probably come up to the surface. You know, it's, it'll come back and start, you know, chewing on um, the organic matter um, and it'll work itself out. But if I can, prevent this, then I'm, I'm going to try to do that. So um, that's where the mulches can, can be, can be nice um, because, you know, uh, if you put, if you just broadcast a seed out and lightly incorporate it and then put um, straw on it or some kind of mulch, like it really kind of seals the deal on germination or like at least it helps it. So it just, I think that, you know, the issue with just putting, broadcasting a seed out on top of the bed and just walking away um, it's going to, you know, it's going to need moisture to germinate and it's going to need maybe consistent moisture for a little while. Um, so with it sitting on top of the bed, um, it might not get that as well as if it was either buried a little bit or had some mulch on top. Um, again, that compost is a, is a big, big thing in maybe getting this, the cover crops established after, after crops. Um, so this was a, this was a corn, uh, my corn beds. Uh, I use two raised beds, like two 30 inch raised beds. I plant like, I think three rows on it, um, two on one and then one on the other. And I think usually that other bed, I'll actually, or the other line, the other row down that second raised bed, um, I'll put another crop in, um, like spinach or something, and then harvest it what, before the corn is getting too tall. tall. Um, but yeah, so corn, it's, I think that goes back to those, the, the residue thing, residue management. So when I harvest corn, 
um, and I look at that field, like after I look, uh, you know, look at the garden, it's, it's, it's just a bunch of residue on top, <laughs> like a bunch. And if I see cover crops into that, just kind of like shake it in there. Um, it does okay. Um, but it's a little slow and sometimes like it doesn't grow like super, super well. Um, I'd rather like have it established, like the cover crop established well. So um, in this picture, like this is actually a little bit of leaf compost. And when I mean a little bit, like this was like maybe like an eighth, an inch, maybe a quarter of an inch of leaf compost. Um, and then I like right on top of the, the corn. And then I seeded the cover crop and then just kind of fluffed it in with a rake. And it took off like, like a lot. It was, it was, it was good. Um, I found that if I'm using like three inches or two inches of leaf compost on top, it kind of buries the seed and maybe even like gets a little hot and dry. Um, I know compost sometimes we think might hold moisture, but um, leaf compost in my experience this year was that it didn't hold moisture that well. So I didn't get great germination and it may have even been too deep in some areas. So just a light layer of compost helped that, um, help that establish. Um, there's some, um, there's, I think that's beets, um, some cover crop going up through beets. Um, I didn't need to tarp that because like the beet, I was just harvesting the beet greens and not the beets. Um, so I just harvested it and like there was enough, um, there was, you know, I, I weeded it and then I broadcast that cover crop in and there was enough like beet residue on top. And I think I had a little bit of leaf compost and I got a really good stand of cover crops on that bed. Um, there are some, um, I want to make sure I'm doing okay on time. There are some um, beds that are still producing. This is my spinach bed. This was like, I think last week. Um, so spinach is still there, but there's like spaces that I've, I've harvested. There's some lettuce beds that I've taken some heads out. And I'm just going to go like, I just go ahead and seed those. Um, I know like on a big scale, like that might be a little bit harder to harvest if there's like cereal rye leaves, like getting into your bags of, of, like, of, of produce. Um, and some folks will actually use a greens harvester. That's more of like a mechanical harvesting tool that would run over this bed and pick like, like leaf, leaf lettuce and such. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily want a living cover crop in those situations, but on my garden bed where I'm handpicking like leaf by leaf, um, I'm okay with having that cover crop already established and going. I actually think it's kind of pretty. So, um, so that's kind of using mulch to get cover crop established. Um, I think I think you, those those cover crops are really important. Um, and this is my bed from like or the, my garden from a different angle. So A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 are different beds. So you can see A1 is dead mulch. Um, that's actually, a, I think, dead sorghum sedan grass. So that was a cover crop that winter killed. That second bed's got one row of cereal rye. That was kind of an experiment. Um, and that middle bed, A3, has got just legumes in it. So no cereal rye. So a little bit easier to kill. I can kill that earlier and plant my brassicas into it. Um, A4 and A5 and our more high biomass cover crops, like they've got a mix. You know, they've got annual ryegrass, cereal rye, um, et cetera. Um, well, yeah, you know, ryegrass, you or I, I don't think I put radishes in there, but there was like crimson clover, bursting clover. And, you know, I think Brian alluded to the fact that like, if you're going to be like crimping these cover crops, like timing is critical. And so usually when um, like the cover crop is flowering is the best time to mow or cut these things down to kill them. However, with those five or six or seven species in that mix, um, they're not gonna flower at the same time. You're gonna have some that are flowering earlier and going to seed and some that are waiting till June. Um, so I'll show you in a little bit, but I, I think the tarp, that black silage tarp to use to kill cover crops is, is almost like a silver bullet in helping me add diversity to my cover crop mixes because now I don't worry about that timing so much because I know that I can just press those things down to the floor, down to the soil surface, even with my foot, and then tarp it for three weeks, and they're all going to be dead. Um, so I've got the added, added benefit of diversity. Granted, I've got plastic over my, my bed for a, couple, for a few weeks, um, which isn't my favorite thing, but it really is a, a good tool. Um, so there's all sorts of good things about cover crops. Each one's got their special superhero power. Um, managing cover crops properly is a good place to look for that. Um, I've got some great tables, um, but in general, I'm just trying to use diverse diversity. And when we've we've got these cover crops in the mix, like the soil thrives, there's a lot of roots in the ground. 
So to till that would be, it would be, it'd be almost painful for me. I know there's like, there's so much fungi in there. There's so much bacteria and good like networks that have developed in between plant, the plant roots and all those or, microorganisms and the organic matter that tillage would go through there and just almost be like a tornado. So um, I like to keep that intact. So we're working on, yeah, trying to kill these cover crops um, without tillage. So to do that, it kind of comes down to like, you know, choosing the right ones. Um, and I think like, um, yeah, I'll, ex I'll explain that in detail, but the first thing you gotta look at is, okay, let's say my bed is done in August. So you can kind of look at these, the Indiana CD windows for cover crops. And this is available at our website at marionswcd.org. Um, and yeah, so let's say the crop's off in August, then I've got a whole bunch of cover crops I can choose from. There's like all a whole, and I know it takes, if this is your first time seeing this chart, like it's, it's a lot, but I would recommend that you take some time with it. Maybe come back to it a few times and just really, you know, think about it and like look at the timings. And um, so, you know, let's say the, uh, let me see, let's say, yeah, let, like the, that spinach that I've got there out there now, like it was um, beginning of October before I actually planted that in a cover crop. So, you know, my options dwindled. You know, there's only like a couple, like I see winter barley, I see cereal rye and your rye grasses options. So those are the ones I used. Um, and then on the previous, on the beds that were, that came out earlier, like I even had a bed come out in June or July um, that was onions and garlic. So I planted a summer cover crop. Now, granted, you could have planted another crop there if you wanted to, um, and that's fine. But I tend to find that in my garden, I'm a little bit more heavier on crops in the spring and a little bit lighter, um, yeah, a little bit lighter in the in the fall. Um, so I can take those shots at, at planting cover crops. Um, and then this is another table that's available on our website, but I think the, the important part of this is the winter survival. So just knowing if your cover crop's gonna survive or if it's gonna die. Um, so I'd encourage you to go back to this chart as well. So if it's, let's look at, um, I don't know, field pea down there, right? It rarely survives or soybeans never survives. Hairy vetch expected to survive. So if you plant hairy vetch, <coughs> expect it to grow in the spring. Um, if you plant seal rye, expect it to be there in the spring. Um, this is kind of like just a, kind of an overshot of, or like an overview of what those dates might look like. So, you know, oats and radish and field peas might, you plant them in August, they're gonna live until December. Cereal rye, you're gonna plant them in October maybe, or even August or I mean, even September, um, along with crimson clover and hairy vetch, and they're gonna live all the way until like April or May or June, um, and they'll start sending seed. Um, whereas the summer cover crops will, like buckwheat and sorghum sedan grass, they're winter killed cover crops. You can plant them in the summer and they'll eventually die. Um, buckwheat might set seed earlier than that, which um, I would advise, unless you know exactly how to manage that seed set. Like I would advise not letting cover crops go to seed um, because they, some of them will germinate again and it might not fit your rotation or that next crop, it might just come back and kind of sprawl out. So, or make planting or harvesting hard. So not letting go, them go to seed is usually beneficial. Um, so winter killed cover crops, like they're on the right or yeah, on the right side of these pictures is a winter killed cover crop. I think these were probably taken in the spring. And then on the left is um, a overwintering cover crop. So you can kind of see in, on the left picture, I do want to draw your attention to those back, way back left beds. They're mulched, um, especially in like a market garden situation. There's no, well, there might be a way, but there's rarely a way to, to, to cover crop 100% of your beds. Like I've seen market gardeners be happy with 30%, you know, um, and the rest, um, you know, the rest might be actually in production, carrots and, and winter crops, which is just as good, right? Um, you got roots in the ground, but, you know, a lot of times um, these, the growers will just mulch the bed out. So it might be leaf mulch, it might be straw, but something to protect that bed over winter. Um, however, if you can get a cover crop in, like, especially the ones with living roots, like, I think you'll, I think you'll like it because just the, what it does to the soil is, is what we're here for. <laughs> um, so you got the dead cover, like, yeah, now I guess, you know, sometimes just because it dies in the wintertime doesn't mean it's not going to create a lot of biomass. So by biomass, I just mean like material. So, you know, something on like the right, like 
like uh, I think that's cereal rye um, and sorghum sinangrass would be one that dies during the wintertime, but might look like that, like because it is just so bulky. Whereas something on the left, like, like oats or radishes or field peas, most of the cover crops are kind of low biomass cover crops when planted without cereal rye and sorghum sinangrass. So I would kind of maybe just make a note, cereal rye, sorghum sinangrass, like bulk, like those are the ones that you can really push out like mulch with, like grow mulch with. Um, which might be good in some situations. So uh, here in this picture, like in the, the foreground, it's lettuce. Like in that situation, like seeded lettuce, I'm not sure that having cereal rye, like the picture on the right would be easy to plant into, right? So that was a dead cover crop or maybe a dead crop that I raked off the bed, maybe put a little compost on and seeded rows of spinach into. The one in the middle, um, like where there's transplants, and straw that was a cover crop that was that was chopped down um, and then straw was put on top of it and transplanted into. I think cover crop chopped down, legume cover crop chopped down um, with a sickle or um, and then I think a layer of newspaper over it and then some some straw mulch and then um, kale transplants. So kind of depending on what you're targeting is is what you the cover crop choice like how to make that cover crop choice. Um, so a little bit of detail on that. Um, there's oats. I'm going to kind of go through quick because I do want to leave question time for questions. But like oats, they die in the wintertime. If you plant them early enough, they're going to give you more biomass. If you don't, if you plant them later, they're going to give you less, of course. Um, growers, including myself, would try to probably rake that off. Um, so the bed on the right is did look like the bed on the left, but I raked the mulch off in the pathways, um, and that gave me more of a seeding like a seeding bed. So if I was transplanting into that, I wouldn't have raked that off. I think that's where the transplant is, is important um, because you can just you can transplant right into that. Um, but it's helpful to, if you're seeding or using one of the seeding tools to maybe rake the, the residue off and get that seeded. Um, there's some lettuce going down some 30 inch beds and with the walkways now oat mulched, <laughs> um, which will help with weed suppression too. Um, I think there's some onions after dead oats that worked really well. Um, on the left, that's, that's, oat mulch that's been raked off and then um, furrowing through to make the rows for something like spinach. And I think, again, back to my point on compost, like having a compost layer might alleviate some of that heavy, deep digging with that hoe. And I know some people might look at that and be like, that's not much at all. But um, yeah, I think just minimizing that is, is helpful. Um, <laughs> if you do try to plant directly into that mulch by seed, um, that's where you might get some mixed results with small seeded stuff like lettuce and carrots. Um, it's, it works like on a raised bed, I found that it, it, it has worked, but you know, you're not going to get like hundred percent germination like you would with a, with a clear bed. Uh, something like beans and larger seeds would probably work in that or would work in that, um, in that situation. But the smaller seeded stuff, um, kind of struggles for germination. Um, I do peas, peas did work well on the left, um, like spring peas did okay seeded into that. Um, I guess just an FYI, but they're probably a little bit larger seeds than something like a carrot or lettuce. Um, so summer cover crops, like that's sorghum sinangrass. grass. So that may have been like a, a bed that was um, onions or garlic or something like spring spinach. And, um, and yeah, so I put that to a cover crop. So I made the choice to start building soil health and to keep it covered and get roots deep into the ground. Um, to try to break up that compaction. Um, so again, I think I showed you this that earlier, but like trying to seed through that was not easy. Um, however, that's sorghum sand grass in that middle row with the lead with the, and then there's sort of, there's sun hemp with the yellow flowers. Um, that row, yeah, that's kind of standing more upright. Um, so to transplant, like it's, it's a little bit more doable. So that a row like that could be weeded down um, or flail mode on a larger scale. Um, and then a flail mower would really chop it up nicely on the right, <laughs> like, like, like that. Um, and then tarp for, you know, in a, in a small garden, you could, you could probably just mulch up, you know, you could add compost and maybe straw on top of that and that'd be fine. Um, but I do like to make sure things are dead <laughs> before planting that next crop. So, um, tarping it for a couple of weeks and then pulling the tarp off and transplanting in, um, is an effective option. So that's might what be what that looks like. Um, just lettuce transplanted right into sorghum sand grass mulch. Um, and that was 
as easy as just slipping it right in. So I know like for, you know, how do you incorporate amendments? This is a fairly good time to do that. And I guess by amendments in this case, I mean more like biology. Um, and Jesse Frost talks a lot about this in his book, um, but you know, he, he will inoculate each of those transplants. He'll actually set his transplant trays in like a compost tea and before he puts it in the ground because he knows that he doesn't get very many options to get some amendments down deep in his soil. So even, you know, putting that, putting those, that compost tea in the rhizosphere, like two inches down, three inches down, will at least add some, you know, some biology. Um, and so that's some ways growers are looking at, you know, adding fertility to their, um, to their successions. There's the lettuce doing nicely. Um, and then overwintering crops. So that high biomass mix of, you know, cereal rye and, and big cover crops, like it might look like that in the spring come June, if you let it get that tall. Um, you ask about mowing it down. So yes, you can mow it, but like, I will say that it's not like, if you mow it at the perfect time, like when it's flowering and that cereal rye is like, has this like pollen head on it, like the, the, the I guess on the top left picture, like the, um, the pollen almost dripping off the, the grains, um, the grain head, like, and then the flowers, the cover crop flowers, like flowering at the perfect time. If that all is in sync, yes, you can mow it and yes, it will kill it, but um, there will be weeds that come back through and some hairy vetch might even regrow or some sewer rye might even regrow. So using those extra measures, and by that I usually mean tarping it for a couple of weeks, like is really beneficial in just making sure that stuff's dead. Um, and I think that's really important, especially at a larger scale. On a raised bed, I've done it several times where I've just mowed it or weeded it down, like mulched up a little bit and transplanted in and then just fine. Um, but for a, a larger size garden, I would consider using some ex extra measures. Um, just a, a little bit more about like killing these cover crops with, with um, yeah, with like no-till termination. So like, you know, that guy's, that person's like rolling it down in the top left, like that's effective, but um, rolling hairy vetch or crimping hairy vetch for example, won't necessarily kill it unless you're using like one of those big roller crimpers that Brian showed you. Um, but like a small scale thing will just not really kill it. And so you like on the bottom left, I tried that and then transplanted the peppers into it. The cereal rye died because it crimped it nicely. It broke that stem. It stopped the water flow going from the, the roots through the stem, um, but it didn't crimp that vetch and then the hairy vetch came back. Um, so, and then on the right, you can see like I cut it and that usually kills the legume. That really killed hairy vetch, but it also spliced like the, um, the cereal rye stem and the cereal rye regrew. So if you roll, like maybe the legumes will come back. If you cut, maybe the cereal rye will come back. So it's a little bit tricky. And that's why I just like, okay, I'm just gonna tarp it. <laughs> um, maybe I'm lazy, but I, I think it's just, yeah, I think it's just the way to go. So um, if I'm wanting to plant this bed, let's say May 15th, um, I will just like, you could use a board, you could use a two by, you know, a two by four and like, or, or even like that roller that we just looked at um, to flatten it out. But pretty much the idea is just to try to get it flat on the ground in one direction if possible, um, and then tarp it for three weeks. So if I'm planting tomatoes or beans on, let's say May 15th, like I'll try to do this on like April 15th, like a month before, um, knock the cover crop down and tarp it. So that's what that might look like. It's down. And then you know, that's that tarp coming off there is probably like two weeks in, not quite dead, right? And then that one on the right is probably more like three to like four weeks in. So it's it's dead. The weeds like are dead. Um, they'll come back a little bit, like eventually, of course, like just the way the world works, but um, it really gets a, a nice kill on everything. Um, so again, it's really hard to rip a furrow through that with a with one of those push behind, like, like walk behind or like the one row cedars, like very, very difficult. Um, so I'm moving more and it's really hard to rake uh, off cereal rye. So if I was going to seed that, I wouldn't have chosen like seeded like four rows of lettuce down that, that bed. I wouldn't have chosen rye. I would have chosen something like a dead a winter killed oats or even like a legume that I could tarp, kill, and then rake off. Um, however, on something like beans, I know it, a bean can come up out of that mulch. And I'm usually just doing two rows. So um, yeah, I'll flatten out that cereal rye. And then I'll just like, you could use a jab planter on like a bigger, bigger area, but just using that trowel to set a seed in um, has worked for me. So it just does really nice, good, 
really good germination on the beans and then that cereal rise there for almost the rest of the year to try to stop like like holding in moisture and, and stopping weeds same thing can be done with something like squash um yeah again that's i think that top left picture just shows how hard it is to to furrow through cereal rye so you can try it but just trust me maybe ahead of time that it's not it's not easy um i have tried seeding like small seeded stuff into rye like this um and it did work um like i used a knife like a pocket knife and i just cut slits through that um so i just said that i wouldn't try lettuce you know maybe at scale you know if it's a 100 foot bed i wouldn't but like maybe maybe it's possible to do this um and i think not all research has been done on this yet so you know trying a little bit here and there is, is not a bad thing um but in general i would probably opt for more of like a, a cleaner bed if i was going to do some seeding um and then if i pulled off that tarp off the off the rye and left that dead cover crop and i was transplanting um i might even on top of that dead cover crop, I might roll out a newspaper roll, like a like a layer of newspaper and like mulch up just to ensure weed suppression throughout this season. Um, I won't spend much time on this, but this is just to show you that that trying to kill rye without a tarp early is tough because it's pesky. Like without tillage, if you try to like push rye down when it's young and you just you don't tarp it, like you're gonna need a lot of mulch to hold that back because it will try to regrow on you. Um, and then Maybe the last, I think the last kind of method that I'm going to talk about is like the legumes. So this is basically the same thing I just talked about with the high biomass mix, except taking that cereal rye out of the equation. Um, so you've got something more like oats and crimson clover. Um, and so instead of like, I use this before like April brassicas, like kale transplants, because it's a little, as I just said, it's hard to kill cereal rye early like that. It takes a little bit of time, especially when the weather's cooler and it's going to need more tarp time. Um, so I might need to tarp it from April to May. But if I want to plant in April, I usually just go for like a legume mix um, and I can just weed eat that down, um, roll a layer of newspaper over it and some straw. And that usually holds back that legume from regrowing. Um, I like to let the, the mulch sit on the bed for like 10 days before actually opening up those transplant holes. Because if you do it any earlier than that, or earlier than that, like if you were to kill the cover crop, put the straw on and open up transplant holes that same day, there's a chance that that light's gonna come in and it's gonna actually, you know, that cereal rye or that the crimson clover is gonna kind of creep out, right? Um, which you might not want around your transplants. So leaving it set for 10 days, same concept as killing it with a tarp. Um, you're just blocking the light for, for amount of time to, to make sure things are dead. Um, and then that's the kale um, a little bit later, it's, it's up. And then the, those beans in the back are the ones that were planted by seed directly into the cereal rye mulch. Um, so I hope I'm getting close to the ending because I said I was going to leave time for questions, but it's getting really close to, to not. <laughs> um, but just to let you know, like that the whole like crop plan, I think this is super helpful to do. <clears throat> um, you can see my beds like A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6. Um, those blue cells are, this is done in Excel, but the blue cells are tarp. Um, so no, um, I know you can't see the previous cover crop coming in into 2021, but pretty much A6, A5, and A4 were something like those high biomass mixes that I needed to kill with a tarp. Um, and then like A2 and A1 were like oats that I could just plant spinach in and then like an early seeded crop. So then, you know, going through, I just look at, you know, okay, I'm going to harvest that spinach in, like, let's say A2, I'm going to harvest it in, um, in June, and then I'm going to tarp that bed for a couple of weeks, and then I'm going to pull it off and plant something else. Um, in that case, I planted sorghum sandgrass and crimson clover, and then I let that grow for a month, tarped it. This is A2, and then I planted, I transplanted the lettuce in. So just, and I'd be happy to share this with, with folks too. Um, yeah, because I think it's it's important to maybe have a template and just kind of see what other growers are doing just to, to know how to, to do that. Um, yeah, that's my garden the other day. <laughs> um this is books maybe take a screenshot of, of that i know this is going to be recorded or come back to it but these are very very important books um i think um they're that Jess, jesse frost go to notillgrowers.com watch every single video you can of his um, listen to all his podcasts fall asleep listening to them wake up in the morning start doing it again um, because there's just a wealth of information in all these books um like Char the charles dowdy the that's an e like more of an England. Um, he's doesn't use much mulch, but he does like there's some valuable things to learn about compost. 
Um, but pretty much all those other gardeners have some things to say about, you know, compost, um, Jean Martin or compost and cover crop. Jean Martin Fortier is more of like the power hero kind of gardener. Um, Daniel Mays is more like a really no till, like, like heavy leaf mulch kind of thing. Jesse Frost is in Kentucky, so it's very valuable for our region. Um, and he just makes a lot of content too um, and experiments. So there's just a lot of stuff about both systems and all systems, like whether it be the shallow mulch, the deep mulch, um, he's just got a lot of information about that. So highly recommend checking out those books and feel free to email me anytime. Sorry, I went so long, um, but I'll stop sharing now. <laughs> and if you've got any questions, maybe there's some time. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kevin. That is one of the best presentations also on that. Uh... I think you and I get along real well because that's the same mentality I work on my farm. Let's try it, see what it works on a little small scale, and then we go larger and uh, and adapt as we go along. Adapt. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you. So th that's also some of the best photographs I've ever seen. Um, are you a photographer? Do you have somebody taking them? No, I, I think I took most all of those, um, maybe except for a few. Um, yeah, that's, I think that's my job is that is to, like I've taken so many photos and then I think there was like 7,000 at one point and I think this, this past spring I willed it, whittled it down to about 2,000 just so it's a manageable to find the pictures. <laughs> so it's a, a labor of love. <laughs> yeah, ex yeah, excellent job. So what questions do you have for the viewers? Uh, I think you covered the, all the chat room we had. Uh, let's, you can go off mute and uh, give us a question. Um, my, my first thought, or one of the thoughts I had there as you went, um, amending soil. Are you yeah. using soil testing and uh, organic matters? How high do you want to go or how high can you get? Uh, any, any comments on that? Yeah, um, my garden started out at like 2.8%. Um, and I wish that, so it was, it's in a community garden and it was, it's, it was tilled like for the past 30 years. And then when I got it, a hold of it, I stopped, right? Like I've fenced it off <laughs> and no more, right? Um, I wish I would have thrown some compost on there and let them till it one more time, um, just to maybe incorporate some compost, like whether it be two inches down, like two inches like of compost, maybe down, get it down six inches just to have a shot of organic matter through that profile. Cause it had been pretty burned up. Like it, like there was, the soil was hard, like it could have been helpful to alleviate compaction. Um, a lot of growers starting a garden will do that. Will like, will even the market farms, they'll, they'll do like a, a one-time tillage um, and then try to move to no-till and just to get those amendments incorporated. You can, um, so um, I didn't do that. So I have been using the broad fork. Hopefully sometimes when I put that compost on, I use broad fork. I'm hoping that some of that compost spills down a little bit. Um, into this into the subsoil. Um, I think the cover crops are helping tremendously push that down. Um, but you know, without tillage, like now when I take a soil test, like even below that organic matter layer, um, I'm up to like five or four point eight. Um, and I honestly, I took those tests after only using about a quarter of an inch of compost over the entire garden. So it wasn't like it wasn't two inches of compost; it was just a quarter of an inch. And I think I've you know in four years I've got it up to five percent. Um, and even more so than that, the biology, like I could, I can actually dip my hands into it and pull out like, you know, diverse earthworms and, you know, 10 earthworms per handful kind of thing. Um, so that being said, I have like, I'm, I'm really bank, like I've been listening to like Dr. Christine Jones, um, some of her um, like ideas on phosphorus and maybe how even adding phosphorus might be like, might be even making our plants like lazy and not digging for it as much. Um, so I think there's some things to be said there, but also at the same time, you know, like our whole buildup in history and studies have been, you know, like a plant needs fertilizer. So it's kind of, I'm trying to balance that, but I do take a soil test um, and I do try to use like an extension document like Michigan or Wisconsin extension has a really good document. I try to use the Midwest Vegetable Growers Guide that Purdue recommends to, um, for some for some um, vegetable recommendations on like how much nitrogen each crop needs or how much phosphorus need each crop needs. Um, so I'll take into account that I've got a certain amount of organic matter and I'll lessen the amount of fertilizer I need to apply. Um, so yeah, I do, I do use like 
um, like in my garden, like when I started out, like the phosphorus and the, the potassium were super high, like very high. So I haven't added that other than in what's in the compost. Um, but the nitrogen, knowing that the soils were compacted um, and I'm still working on that, like there's probably not as much natural nitro, nitro, like nitrogen cycling happening. So I have added like feather meal um, in the, the amounts like recommended by those extension services. Um, I, I also have high pH like most gardeners here in Indianapolis. Um, and so I've been using sulfur, um, yearly applications of that. Um, so when you get a soil test back, it might say till in 10 pounds of sulfur per thousand square feet. Um, and then like some extension services would say, don't do it any more than 20 pounds. Um, but I, I only do, I used to do 10 to 15 pounds, but I'm starting to think like that's maybe too much for just the top player, like just the top dresses. So I backed that down to like five pounds per thousand square feet of sulfur um, and more like doing it yearly other than like every other year. Um, so I'm just trying to think through those things. I think we need more research on that and more, yeah, maybe more help like on, on the, that fertility side of things. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question very well. Um, I mean, I, I do, I do use like feather meal, like, because it seems like it's more, um, it's like light and it seems like it's almost like if I put it on top of the bed, it's not really going to like burn the crops. It's a very low nitrogen fertilizer, like low analysis. And it, it feels like it's like kind of water soluble. So it's going to maybe get into my soils a little bit. You know, if I could put compost on top of that nutrient application, I would, um, but I'm definitely don't think it's as critical, critical enough to, to till it into this, like to make that tillage pass. Um, I'd rather just try to build the biology there. I'm not sure if that answered your question well enough, Mike. Um, it's, it's, I'm just uh, looking for more questions. Anybody yeah. out there? What, what, do you got? what are your questions? Have you ever transitioned from a previous residential or commercial property? Any experience on that? Um, yeah, I've never met. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. And so working with like, um, I mean, we did soil testing back in 2015, like through a, <clears throat> through a grant. And, you know, I was, I broke like, just completely busted the heck out of a pair of boots. And I think my soil probe was probably broken by the end of the day, <laughs> um, just because you're hitting asphalt, you know, you might hit a brick or you might hit like, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, a lot of our soil tests came back clean on contamination, but there's definitely some arsenic and some lead. Um, that's really not supposed to be my forte, but there's no way that you can work in the urban world and with growers and not like get to know, not, not try to help, help, help figure that out because it's just a, a fact of life and it affects the way we grow. So um, yeah, like there's like some documents that are okay, like um, that kind of tell um, you know, if it's a certain lead level, maybe you should not garden in that soil, but rather build a raised bed. Um, there has been some farms here that have just like capped their whole site with like two feet of like wood chips and then started gardening on top of that. Like, and then like laid out a bunch of soil um, on top to build their beds. That's, ex that's expensive. That's a lot of expense and time and labor. <laughs> so a grant might be helpful in that situation. Um, but still like I actually gardened on one of the sites once and I felt like I was sinking I felt like that 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 wood chips were decomposing over time and I'm not I'm just I wasn't super comfortable with how yeah how far how, like I wasn't super comfortable with like knowing that contamination was not getting up in my crops so again not an expert on it but um yeah I think there's definitely like if you're if you're going to garden in the urban world like you should get your soil tested um, and, you know, that could be like around the, like, I think first step would be to like look at old aerials and just to know where foundations of buildings were, not only for contamination, like higher increases of probability of lead coming off like lead paint off the foundation, like painted found it like, you know, where the house was painted um, back in, you know, pre-1970 or whatever it was, um, but also to like, you know, not be gardening in rubble <laughs> and to just know that, you know, like if you put a tiller in there, you might be hitting bricks. It can be complicated. <laughs> um, that the Allen County Soil and Water Conservation District does have a, uh, a
grant right now where we are offering free soil testing um, to farmers and market gardeners within the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, and if you're curious about whether you are in the WLEB um, on the Indiana side, go ahead and give us a call. Um, our number is 260-484-5848, extension three. Um, I'll put that number in the chat as well. But if you're interested in some free soil testing and whether you're in that watershed, um, we are offering free soil testing to um, certain small farms and urban gardeners and farmers. That's great. Yeah, and Mike, you asked me like what like what we're getting matter level to target. Like I've heard that like um, you know you should look at what the forest were around your area and maybe add a percent. <laughs> I don't know who came up with that, but like my goal is uh, like I'm fine with five percent. I think it's working. I wouldn't mind six. Um, I think there's some some farm or some gardens, especially like raised beds that get up in the area of like twelve and fourteen percent. Um, and yeah, I'm like coming from a soil background and like in our CS training, like I'm not sure we're completely trained in that kind of substrate because it's not really sometimes not even soil anymore. It's more like compost. Um, and but yeah, I think like just learning from the growers that are using these deep composting systems to kind of figure out the intricacies of that and like what kind of watering needs there are, what kind of nutrient needs there are. Um, and, you know, sometimes like you might even have too much organic matter and not enough like that it actually like doesn't let this plant be stable, like even standing upright. Like I think there's been instances where like a crop would even like a tomato plant would even like almost fall over just because there's so much organic matter. Um, so I think not striving too high, but maybe that middle ground, like I think, I think 6% would be like a decent goal for around here. Yeah, I concur. Um, my forefathers, when, when our area was broken up here from the woodland, it's all woodland soil, the majority of it, and high clay content. And uh, they start at usually 1.7%, 1.8%. And uh, a lot of my samples now are in 5%, 4% organic matters, but I also have a lot of the low ones yet. So I have a mean of uh, 3.8, something like that right now on my farm. That's cool. Well, increasing, right? That's great. I'd like to see it. I'd like to see your farm, Mike. All right. Um, I'm going to do a couple things. We have uh, coffee and integrated pest management uh, virtual meeting coming up on November 16th of uh, 2021. So uh, it's with Marissa Wren and uh, others. So that should be an interesting one that we can uh, get into the pests. This was one of the, the best discussions on the, on the gardening and the no-till that we've ever had. So thank you, Kevin. Is there any follow-up comments from anyone? Uh, I know Brian uh, presented very well and uh, covered our farming. Looks like we have more uh, urban gardeners on here than the, than the farmers. So uh, did great. So I think uh, we're close enough to just end this, unless anyone has another comment or Brian or Kevin. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us. This has been a great presentation and we'll look forward to seeing you on November 16th. Thanks.